All right. So tonight um, we are in Hebrews chapter nine. Um, we'll probably have a couple of others joining us shortly. But I'll share my screen. There we go. There we go. Get that off to the side. And uh, greetings to everybody joining us also on Facebook. Um, in the, the Facebook notes, you'll have to text me if you have a question um, for something to discuss during this Bible study. Um, phone number is listed for you there, 419-262-8280. And tonight, um, last time we had looked at Hebrews chapter 8, and most of Hebrews chapter 8 was the direct quotation from, um, yes. Yes, from Jeremiah. Uh, from Jeremiah, where he had talked about this new covenant that God would make. Um, where he just, he just quotes like six or seven verses right in a row out of Jeremiah chapter 31. And, um, and all of Jeremiah chapter 31, you know, leads up to or hinges on that last part, that last aspect of God's promise. Um, verse 12, for I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. So last time we talked a little bit about the, the different covenants um, that, you know, that relationship, that kind of contracted um, legally binding relationship that God had made with his people at various points throughout history. We talked especially about, um, you know, the, the general covenant with all creation after the flood that, um, that God would not destroy the entire earth with a flood. Um, and he promised that and he showed that with the rainbow. Um, we talked about the promise of, of God in Genesis chapter 12, that God would bless all nations through Abraham's descendant. Um, and that, that was the, the covenant of Genesis 12. Genesis 15, God repeated that covenant um, in a vivid way where Abraham cut all the animals in half and God alone, uh, symbolized by the, the torch and the fire pot, um, passed through the middle of those pieces. And then the sign of the covenant in Genesis 17 that, uh, that God instituted that sign of the covenant, that it wasn't the covenant itself, but um, that circumcision was the sign of the covenant of, of God's continued promise that he would carry out um, the promise of a, of a son and eventually a savior through the family line of Abraham. Um, what we didn't really talk about with a whole lot of depth, or at least we didn't look at um, specifically, was that portion from Exodus, I think it was Exodus chapter 25, um, you know, shortly after the giving of the law at Mount Sinai. And God says, if you keep all these things, and if you do this, then you'll be my people, then be my treasured possession. And, and that covenant, that covenant relationship was specifically with the nation of Israel, talking about the historical nation of Israel, um, bound for a specific period of time, um, to those who were at Mount Sinai and those who were members of the physical nation of Israel. But that covenant from, from Mount Sinai is not binding on all Christians. And, and a lot of Christians can really get off track thinking that, um, thinking that if we just follow God's law, then God will bless us. And, and even you see this in, in social media um, very often. You know, it comes around every three, four years, at least in my news feed. Um, the idea that that covenant relationship that God had with his people, that with the nation of Israel, God had said, if you turn your back on me, then I will, then I will allow plague and pestilence to devour your land, uh, strife to devour you from within and invaders from abroad. Um, and people try to take that passage and what God says there about that specific covenant with the political state of Old Testament Israel. They try to take that specific covenant relationship and apply it to our country today and say, well, only if our people in America turn back to God, then God would bless us. But the reason that we are experiencing these bad things is because we've turned our backs on God. And that's not correct. Um, it, well, it, it, it may be, we may be experiencing um, at certain times in certain places, we may experience the result of having turned our backs on God. Um, at the same time, we cannot draw a rectilinear 
or a, a linear connection between this event happened here as a direct result of my disobedience there. Um, that when God sets up this covenant with his people, um, specifically a covenant with, with Noah and then with Abram um, and Abraham, and when Abram's name is later changed, and then with the people of Israel, that God does that for the purpose of certainty, to make his people certain and to reassure them that he is going to be faithful to his promise. But we can't, and, and so as Christians today, um, living, in, living in the country we do, um, we hold on to the specific promises that God made through Abram. Those, those, um, those continuing and ongoing gospel, one-sided covenant relationships where God promises and commits himself to bless his people through that descendant of, of Abraham. But we don't go searching through and combing through Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers, looking for all the conditional promises that God made to the, the nation of Israel and say, well, only if we did these things, then God would bless us. And if we only got the hearts of the people to turn back to God, then we would experience success. And then we wouldn't have to deal with a pandemic or fill in the blank, whatever the, the great Satan of the day happens to be, because it changes like every three or four or five years. Um, or maybe every three, four, or five weeks. <laughs> and, uh, and I guess in that, we need to keep our eyes focused on, on the Word of God instead of the improper interpretations, where the Word of God is grounded down here in verse 12, where all of God's promises are grounded in this one-sided gospel covenant that is the fulfillment of everything that he had promised to Abram. Um, that that Abram, through Abram's descendant, the, the one savior of the world would come. And this is a one-sided covenant where God is not demanding anything. He says, I will forgive their wickedness and I will remember their sins no more. And as a result of God forgiving their wickedness and remembering their sins no more, um, you've got all the preceding things um, in, in this quotation from Jeremiah chapter 31, um, this new covenant that, you know, put their, my law in their minds and on their hearts. I will be their God. They will be my people. No longer will man teach his neighbor because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest. And it all is grounded in that one-sided relationship that God starts and that God maintains um, through the forgiveness of sins. So with that background, um, we've, we've discussed, or at least the writer to the Hebrews has discussed um, the the priesthood. He's discussed the sacrifices, and now he gets a little bit more to the, the nuts and bolts of their worship life. Um, he's going to draw a direct comparison to the earthly tabernacle, which, which is kind of interesting, because at the time, here in chapter 9, at the time when he's writing this, um, as far as we can tell, the temple is still standing. But he refers specifically to this, this tabernacle, um, as mentioned here in verse 2, um, because he's referring by comparison to the law as it had been given and instituted through Moses and to the, the tabernacle and the law and their practices, perhaps, as they thought of them, not necessarily as God had intended them, but he's dealing with his audience from where they are, that he's dealing with his audience as people who have, who have misunderstood and, and twisted God's, God's worship life and all the regulations of their worship life into instead of instead of being a channel of blessings from god um, they turn them into a set of obligations that we have to fulfill for god and that if we do these things then god will bless us um, and so he's going to talk a little, a little bit about the comparison between uh, the tabernacle and the greater the greater reality that we have in jesus um, and He's talking about also the carrying, how Jesus carried out um, his high priestly work. And that's, that's really what he's going to be um, talking about here, as well as the, the fulfillment of this new covenant that, um, that we have in the Lord's Supper. And he wants to make sure that you don't miss the point. <laughs> um, and so what we, as, we, as we get into this, we need to uh, really begin... Um, back in chapter 8, verse 12, um, because he's, he's dealing with this new covenant, and he's also dealing with the, 
the previous covenant. Um, this new covenant, um, this new covenant in the blood of Jesus from chapter 8, verse 12, for I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more, um, which is basically a reiteration of the exact same covenant that God had had in place and had given and had spoken to Abram all the way back in Genesis chapter 12, you know, like 2000 BC. Um, here we are nearly 2000 years later, and he wants to understand that, he wants all of us to understand that this covenant, um, this covenant given for the specific purpose of communicating God's grace to us, of showing how God's grace has been given to us, and that this is, you know, when we talk about our relationship to God, that it is certainly only a one-sided thing where God does the work and we are the recipients of his grace. Um, when it comes to our relationship with God, there's no, there's no, if you do this, then God will do that kind of set up. Because verse 13, this covenant, um, this in calling this covenant new, uh, that's the important word here, calling this covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete. And what is obsolete and aging will soon disappear. Um, that disappearance, most likely, you know, talking about the, the finality of the destruction of the temple, and that everything that was going on there at the temple in Jerusalem would be finally um, made obsolete and, and disappear, be totally wiped off the face of the Temple Mount. So before we get into chapter 9, were there any lingering questions about, um, about covenants, um, covenant relationship, or any of that from last time? Cool. Lucas, still like your haircut. <laughs> All right. Uh, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 1. Now the first covenant had regulations for worship and also an earthly sanctuary. A tabernacle was set up. In its first room was the lampstand, the table, and the consecrated bread. This is called the holy place. Behind the second curtain was a room called the most holy place, which had the golden altar of incense and the gold-covered Ark of the Covenant. This Ark contained the gold jar of manna, Aaron's staff that had budded, and the stone tablets of the covenant. Above the ark were the cherubim of the glory, overshadowing the atonement cover. Or perhaps you remember um, the term mercy seat from, you know, the King James or, or some hymns um, talking about the mercy seat. Um, we'll talk about that when we get to verse 5. But we cannot discuss these things in detail now. When everything had been arranged like this, the high priests entered regularly into the outer room to carry on their ministry. But only the high priest entered the inner room and that only once a year, and never without blood, which he offered for himself and for all the sins of the peop that the people had committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit was shown by this that the way into the most holy place had not yet been disclosed, as long as the first tabernacle was still standing. This is an illustration for the present time, indicating that the gifts and sacrifices being offered were not able to clear the conscience of the worshiper. They are only a matter of food and drink and various ceremonial washings, external regulations applying until the time of the new order. When Christ came as high priest of the good things that are already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not man-made, that is to say, um, not a part of this creation. He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption. The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God? For this reason, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. In the case of a will, it is necessary to prove the death of the one who made it, because a will is in force only when somebody has died. It never takes effect while the one who made it is living. That is why even the first covenant was put, not put into effect without blood. When Moses had proclaimed every commandment of the law to all the people, he took the blood of calves together with water, scarlet wool, and the branches of hyssop, and sprinkled the scroll in all the people. He said, This is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you to keep. In the same way, he sprinkled with the blood both the tabernacle and everything used in its ceremonies. 
In fact, the law requires that neither, nearly everything be cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. It was necessary then for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these sacrifices, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ did not enter a man-made sanctuary that was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself, now to appear for us in God's presence. Nor did he enter heaven to offer himself again and again, the way that the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood that is not his own. Then Christ would have had to suffer many times since the creation of the world. But now he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. Just as man is destined to die once and after that to face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many people. And he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. So that is chapter 9. Um, cool. We'll just keep going. Um, unless there are any questions as we kind of get into this. And so the, uh, the contrast that we've got is between the first covenant um, and they're talking about that, that law-based relationship where God says, if you do this and if you keep these things, then you are my people. And if you do not do this, then you'll, you will not reap the benefits of being my people. Um, they, they talk about the regulations for worship, we we'll go with blue, and then uh, regulations for the, the sanctuary, uh, we'll go with orange, um, because we already have orange here as the tabernacle. And uh, there will be a few more details that, that kind of come through here. Um, the first covenant had regulations for worship and also an earthly sanctuary. And God was very purposeful about that, uh, where he reiterated to Moses that Moses was supposed to set up the tabernacle exactly according to the plan that he had seen it on the mountain. And the point that the writer to the Hebrews makes is that that isn't just God being particular and specific. That's also God um, saying that there's some, there's some pointed and substantial value, something that God is trying to teach through this. Um, and so you remember this, you know, maybe you've seen this in, the, in some sort of a sketch or a map or a picture or a diagram or something where you've got kind of this courtyard. Uh, well, there's everything that's outside the tabernacle area. And then there's kind of this, this wall of curtains all around it. Um, and then inside is, that wall of curtains is, is the courtyard area. And it had to be on curtains because they had to be able to take it down and set up and move it and that sort of thing. And in that courtyard area is where they've got um, the main altar for burning sacrifices and offering sacrifices. And, um, and I think in the tabernacle, at least, that was as far as a Jewish family could come. Later in the, um, when we have the temple period after Solomon, you know, around, around the year 950, 900 or so, um, after Solomon is when we have the temple where God elongates that structure a little bit. So you've got, um, if you were to walk up the stairs and get to the top of the temple mount, um, that outer area with the colonnade all around it, that covered walking, walkway all the way around it, um, was the court of the Gentiles. And then you pass the little wall and get into the next kind of walled area, which is the court of the Jewish women. The next walled area from there is the court of the Jewish men. And then you get into the holy place and then the, the most holy place or the holy of holies. And what God was teaching with both of those things is that, uh, first of all, that you can't just waltz into God's presence on your own, but that you need the shedding of blood in order for there to be forgiveness. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. In this setup, um, talking about uh, the first room, verse two, first room, um, we have the, the lampstand and the table and the consecrated bread. Um, the consecrated bread, perhaps you remember that, um, that time when, when David was on the run and, and he and his companions ate that consecrated bread, um, even though they were not from the Levites, they were not serving as priests. And, that's, and Jesus used that to say, you know, basically that the, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Um, and this first room of the holy place, you know, this lampstand, you know, this lamp where the fire is supposed to be continually going, continually burning. Um, and the consecrated bread, 
um, in those in those two things, that was like resembling the, the visible presence of God, um, where God is visibly with his people, or God is visibly sustaining his people. Um, and then that, that bread would be baked new every morning. And then the, the Levites would eat the day old bread, I suppose, as part of their, you know, sustenance while serving there at the temple. Um, and as the visible representation of the presence of God, um, maybe, you know, not necessarily, but maybe it does call to mind, you know, Psalm 10, what is it, Psalm 109, I think. Uh, we just had that verse the other night, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. It's, um, it's the verse of the day for this coming Sunday. And the consecrated bread um, that, you know, even where Jesus says that he is the bread of life. Um, and they don't have all of that and that, that full or that, you know, they weren't, didn't have those verses in mind when they saw those things or when the priests saw those things or when the priests taught about those things. But those things were simply there um, to demonstrate that here you are in the presence of God, um, that this is an ongoing thing where God himself is the one who gives light and God himself is the one who sustains um, yeah, sorry, that was Psalm, Psalm 119, not Psalm 109. I guess that would be a, a fairly safe guess then. Um, if uh, you know, Psalm 119 is the, the longest, longest book in the Bible or the longest chapter in the Bible and longest Psalm. So if you don't know what it is, just guess Psalm 119. Um, anyway, so that was the, the first room and that was the, that was the holy place um, as compared to the, the most holy place behind the second curtain was that, that other room that was called the most holy place. Well, fairly simple. Um, and the structure of the most holy place, um, at least, and, and I think it's the same, same basic dimensions in the tabernacle, or same proportions at least. Uh, but what we have when we have the temple built is that the most holy place is, um, is a perfect cube. Um, it's the same width as, as depth as height. And if you put it all together, then it seems like there's a little, there would be a little room above the most holy place in Solomon's temple. Um, and it's possible, one might even say probable, that that is the room where they kept the scrolls for, uh, for the Old Testament. Um, possible. Uh, so anyway, you, you can picture this. You walk through, um, you walk past that, that opening altar outside of the tabernacle, walk into the, the holy place where the priest would go every day to carry out his tasks. And then there's that second curtain, um, the most dividing the holy place from the most holy place. And remember here, we still talk about the tabernacle because, because he's referring to God's law as it had been originally set up. And what the people are thinking that they are, using as the basis for their relationship with God. Um, that the devout Jewish person is saying, you know what, I'm going to go back to the Pentateuch, go back to what God says there in the book of Exodus and the book of Leviticus, and that is how I approach God. But the writer to the Hebrews, in the, in the main point that he's using or driving at here, is that Jesus is the fulfillment of all of those things. And so if you think that your, your devotion um, is is properly directed when we're when we're going through all the elements of Old Testament worship according to the Pentateuch, um, then you're sorely mistaken. Because if you don't have if you don't have Jesus, then you don't have the real access to God. Um, and so you know the most holy place, the the second curtain, um, is where only the high priest could go. And in that same arrangement between holy place and most holy place is, is mirrored on a larger scale when we have Solomon building the first temple and then uh, the second temple after the exile. That um, the worship meant that the, only the high priest was allowed to go in the most holy place and then only, only once per year. And that this high priest had to be from the family of Aaron, um, descended from that, that high priestly family. And, um, and he's going to make a, a, few more, a few more applications in the next paragraph about that. So we'll just keep going. Uh, verse 4, talking about what is back there. Um, the golden altar of incense and the gold-covered Ark of the Covenant. Um, some, some might have said, some people think that this altar of incense um, was more about or more like a... Um, a sensor where you put the the sensor or the incense into that that sensor and then you put the coals in there and then that sensor um would would burn and smoke um it's possible 
Um, but if you if you just think of it as this altar of incense where they would put the incense and burn the incense, and it didn't have to be exceptionally large, um, but then the smoke would go up through a little hole in the, the top of the tabernacle um, or through the, the top of the top of the temple. Um, so the two things that are in there in the most holy place are the Holy of Holies, if you've heard that term as well, uh, Altar of Incense and the Ark of the Covenant. And in this Ark of the Covenant uh, were three things, um, this gold jar of manna, Aaron's staff that had budded, and the stone tablets of the covenant. And each of these things, um, the gold jar of manna, as, uh, that was something that they had preserved and that, they had, that God had told them to gather um, before they entered into the promised land. Um, because normally, normally when you gathered manna, then it was only good for that day. And if you gathered too much, then it would be full of worms the next day. Um, and the only day that you were supposed to gather double was the day before the Sabbath day. Um, but God wanted the jar of manna in there to, to be a testimony and to be a reminder to the generations for come, to come of how God had provided for his people with this miraculous manna from heaven. Um, Aaron's staff that had budded, that was the controversy over who was allowed to be the priest or the high priest of God's people. And, um, and each of the each of the priests or each of the representatives from each of the different tribes put their staff, I think, in the, in the tabernacle overnight and whichever staff happened to happen to bud um, would be the one that God had chosen. And Aaron's staff not only budded, but it flowered and then it produced almonds overnight, you know, and he's been walking around with this staff for 30, 40, 50 years, probably. <laughs> so it's, it's pretty apparent, you know, God wanted to make sure. Um, and, and what that kind of brings to mind, um, at least, is, is that God has actually, you know, he's, he's designated and designed the ministry that he, he wants people to serve, and especially in a public fashion in in an authoritative fashion within the church, he wants men to serve um, in this in this particular way, and that is foreshadowed with Aaron's staff um, being being the one chosen and budding. Um, that God instituted the ministry for the good of His people, and not as something to be argued about, but as something through which God would serve His people. And the stone tablets of the covenant, um, talking about the Ten Commandments, there. And, you know, you picture just Charlton Heston coming down from Mount Sinai with these two tablets of stone. And, um, and we even sometimes talk about the, the two tablets or the, you know, the two, the two tables of the law, excuse me, talking about the two tables of the law as, you know, commandments one through three of our relationship to God and the commandments four through 10 of our relationship to others. Well, realistically, that's kind of a false dichotomy, although it might be helpful for a teaching aid. Um, but that all of it deals with our relationship to God. And as a result of our relationship to God, um, the way God has designed our relationship with others. But that idea of the, the two tablets, you know, that um, we, we think of it as, you know, here are all the Ten Commandments written on the front of both of these two, you know, one through five and six through 10, or one through three and four through 10, whatever. Um, but each of those, it's actually two copies of the Ten Commandments written on the front and on the back um, of Commandments 1 through 10. And Moses has two copies. I think we touched on this last time or maybe the time before um, that, that the people put their copy of the terms of the covenant in that Ark of the Covenant because that is, that is the safest location that is like the, you know, where they were where the crown jewels would be stored, the crown jewels of England or whatever. Um, and so they put their copy in that safe deposit box that is located in the center of the camp in that most secure of places. And then they put God's copy in the, in the place that represented God's presence. And it happened, it just so happened, um, the way that it was set up, that both places happen to be the Ark of the Covenant. Um, where the Ark of the Covenant was the most secure location because it was always with the people, it was always in the center of the camp, and it also represented God. And so these two stone tablets um, are, you know, two copies of the Ten Commandments, two tablets, um, each of them engraved with the Ten Commandments on front and on back. And what he doesn't mention here is um, that the other pieces of the stone tablets, the, the first set that Moses had broken at the time of the golden calf incident, um, I think is that Exodus chapter 32, uh, Moses comes down and God had carved out those, those tablets and written on them. And uh, Moses smashed them because he was so 
enraged and rightfully so. <laughs> um, and when he goes back up and God, God's like, all right, you got to chisel them out now. Um, and, and then Moses was the one who cut out those, that second set of, of tablets. Um, so that's what is in the ark. Um, number five, above the ark, still describing the ark itself, were the cherubim of glory um, overshadowing the atonement cover. Uh, that atonement cover um, is just the, the cover to the Ark of the Covenant, um, also called the mercy seat. Is that that's like the traditional King James Version translation um, that maybe it was just translated that way once and uh, it just kind of stuck because that was the main Bible translation for 400 years. Um, and, that, and that really, you know, visualizes God's presence. And then um, when, the, when the priest, we'll talk about this in verse 7, when the priest enters that area, then he uses this, this blood. On, he enters that most holy place, the Holy of Holies, on one day a year, and he uses this blood for a special purpose. Um, at the end of verse 5, but we cannot discuss these things in detail now, um, just referring to the, the fact that the, the Ark of the Covenant has disappeared. It disappeared um, and had been stolen away, hidden away perhaps, um, at the, shortly before the Babylonians um, destroyed Jerusalem. So it might still be hidden somewhere underneath the sands of Judah. Um, <laughs> there's, you know, there's a place in Ethiopia that says that they have it, but nobody can go in and see it. Um, and I think there's like two or three other places like that in the world. Um, but as you well know from, from watching Indiana Jones, the Ark of the Covenant is actually in a warehouse in Hollywood somewhere. Uh, verse 6. So when everything had been arranged like this, uh, the priests entered regularly in the, into the outer room to carry on their ministry. Um, and we're talking here about, um, about the person. We're talking about frequency. We're talking about a place. Um, that's a lot of orange. And, uh, and we're talking about an activity. Um, so those are, those are kind of the four main categories that he's going to be discussing as we continue. Talking about the person, talking about the frequency, the place, and the activity. Uh, verse 7, only the high priest entered the inner room. Talking about the person. Um, talking about the place, the inner room. Talking about the frequency is this once a year and um and talking about what does he do uh never without blood so always with blood sorry i can't highlight tonight uh, always with blood blood that was offered for himself and for the sins of the people the sins that the people had committed in ignorance um, because the, the premise is by, by that day, the great day of atonement, which happened once a year, um, every, every Jewish man has already presented himself to the Lord twice before that day over the course of the year. And every Jewish person who is ceremonially unclean has already been to the tabernacle, has undergone the sacrifices, has been brought into a restoration, a restored relationship with God and uh, with his representative. And so that great day of atonement um, talks about, he really focuses especially on uh, the sins that the people had committed in ignorance that, uh, you know, who can, who can discern his ways um, that the, the, the thoughts of a person's heart are known only to a person and uh, sometimes not even then. And uh, the purpose in all this was that uh, the Holy Spirit was shown by this, that the way into the most holy place had not but yet been disclosed as long as the first tabernacle was still standing. Excuse me, was still standing. Um, and and in, in this, uh, verse 8, had not yet been disclosed. Um, maybe the word there is, you know, revealed. Um, it, was, it was the way into the most holy place was there. Um, in the person and work of the promised Messiah. But that was not yet revealed to the person in all of his work and all of his, all of his glory, all of his activity. Um, it's not until Jesus begins his earthly ministry and John the Baptist points to him and says, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. It's not until that point where people begin to see God's plan of salvation revealed. Um, they see that plan of salvation put into action and they experience it in its fullness. And so um, 
as long as the first tabernacle was still standing, talking about this first tabernacle and, and the point that he's really driving toward is the contrast with the first covenant that we had all the way back in chapter nine, verse one. Now the first covenant had regulations for worship and also an earthly sanctuary. Um, and so that's, that's the point of comparison here. Um, I'm breaking the, the color scheme already. Um, that the, as long as this first tabernacle is still standing, that they, they don't understand, they don't see the person and work of the Messiah in fulfillment, but only prefigured in sacrifice and prefigured in prophecy. Um, and, and if you're just looking at, you know, verses one through eight of this chapter by itself, he's really leading you to kind of a subtle logical conclusion that the tabernacle, you, you just work verse eight backwards, that the tabernacle isn't standing anymore. Um, that the second part, that the way into the most holy place has been revealed and that this continual revealing of the way into the holy place, the way into God's presence now and forever is dependent on the work of the Holy Spirit in word and sacrament. Um, and that's, that's where he leads us. You know, if you didn't catch it in verse eight and the, the subtlety, you know, if, if you're preaching, you like read, you say verse eight and then you pause and you say it again a little bit slower <laughs> so that everybody's like, wait a second, there's something important here. Um, I understand what's going on because the first tabernacle isn't standing. And then he's like, oh, verse nine, just in case, um, this is an illustration for the present time indicating that the gifts and sacrifices being offered were not able to clear the consciences of the worshiper. Um, and, and verse 10, I guess that goes together. They are only a matter of food and drink and various ceremonial washings, external regulations applying until the time of the new order. And this, you know, verses 9 and 10 <laughs> gets into a little bit of the, the broader question about the purpose of the book of Hebrews that, um, that these gifts and sacrifices were intended to clear the conscience of the worshiper, but, but the way they were intended was to foreshadow the coming Messiah. <laughs> and that the people in their, in their rampant obsession with, you know, reverting back to Judaism for whatever reason, with their, with their fervor to go back to J the Jewish way of life, they have, they have turned what God intended as a channel of his grace, and they have turned it upside down into a, a means for them to atone for their own sin. Um, that's, that's the main point, <laughs> you know, verses 9 and 10. Um, I guess the, the broader discussion there is, is talking about the specific audience of the entire book of Hebrews, that the specific, the writer to the Hebrews is dealing as much with a misconception about Jewish worship life as he is dealing with a misconception about the person and work of Jesus. And so he, he kind of has to address both of those things, where he has to address the misconception and tear down their misconception, as well as show that Jesus is superior in every way to their, their misconception, um, as well as to the reality that the, the Old Testament worship life pointed ahead to the person and work of Jesus. Um, so an illustration for the present time, indicating that the gifts and sacrifices being offered um, talking about the, the, the duties, the, the activities that are carried on, um, we're not able to clear the conscience of the worshiper. Well, no, duh. <laughs> because it wasn't about effort about the sacrifices. It wasn't supposed to be about the sacrifices. And even, even our hymn, not all the blood of beasts on Israel's altar slain could give the guilty conscience peace or wash away the stain. Um, that, but maybe there is an element here where the people um, where the people have this concept that is that is wrong um, we'll give this I haven't had much blue uh, they have this concept that is wrong that in some way um, their own forgiveness depended on what they did and if they allowed themselves to be ceremonially unclean for too long or if they you know didn't atone for everything properly then they could never be sure and and the reason that what he's going to go on to here in the next little section the reason that they could never be sure is because those sacrifices uh, were inferior because if they were able to take away sin they would not be offered again and again um, but the fact that they are offered regularly you know in verse six 
um, shows that they that these sacrifices were not able to to clear the conscience to give the guilty conscience peace. Um, they are only a matter of food and drink and various ceremonial washings, um, all under this idea, this headline of external regulations. Um, and we, we should be cautious, I suppose, that we don't make too much or too little of verse, of verse 10. Um, that, that this idea of being only a matter of food and drink, yes, it is talking about the, um, it is talking about the Old Testament, Old Testament regulations. And, but once Jesus has fulfilled all of those Old Testament regulations, there's no need to go back to it. There's no blessing in going back to it. Uh, but the people who had lived before Jesus and who are waiting for the Messiah, they did receive the blessing of forgiveness given to them, transmitted to them through those means, through those sacrifices. Um, it's really, you know, both and, at least for the people before Jesus. Um, but now, now that Jesus has come, um, these regulations, they have been superseded, um, superseded by this, this new order. And so, you know, we don't want to make too much. We don't want to make too little of verse 10. Um, that, you know, we, our, our concept of adiaphora is the plural, or adiaphoron is the singular, of um, things neither commanded nor forbidden by God. Um, things that, that you have the freedom to do or to the freedom to refrain from doing. And whether or not you engage in a particular activity um, depends on all of the underlying ideas for proper the proper use of Christian freedom. Um, so for instance, you know, some of the, the hot topics that come to mind um, are Christian's use of alcohol, Christian's use of tobacco, um, a Christian's gambling or not gambling. Um, these things where God has not specifically said, you must gamble or you must not gamble, you must smoke, you must not smoke, um, you must <laughs> drink alcohol or you must refrain, um, or even, you know, caffeine. Um, you must have caffeine every day because it's delicious or you may not have caffeine every day. And, and it sounds a little ridiculous at first, um, or, you know, like celebrating birthdays or donating blood. <laughs> it sounds a little ridiculous until you, you understand that, um, those rules and regulations are what what false beliefs use to pull, to pull people away from the true God. Um, that even you know, like the Jehovah's Witnesses, they'll forbid um, birthdays and and other celebrations, um, and say that it is wrong to do that. They might forbid blood transfusions. Um, or, or other segments within the Christian church. You know, the J-dubs aren't Christian because they deny the person and work of Jesus Christ. Um, but within the Christian church, there are those who say that gambling is unequivocally always a sin or that the use of alcohol is always wrong. Um, but for the Christian who reads the Bible, we see that, in a sense, we have been set free from... Um, we aren't we aren't living under that old the terms of the old covenant and when we talk about um what we can do what we cannot do uh verse 10 doesn't really doesn't really apply to our adiaphora um but it does inform us with the freedom that we have in christ and he's going to expand on that here um beginning in verse 11 that the purpose here in verse 10 the purpose of all these regulations um, was to kind of, as Paul talks about it in Galatians, to be a, a guide or a pedagogue um, until, until Jesus came, to lead them to Christ, to kind of keep them on that road until Jesus arrived. And Jesus being the fulfillment of all of those um, sacrificial orders, that Jesus has given the greatest sacrifice of all and made all of those previous sacrifices obsolete. And that's what he's really getting at here. Because um, back in verse 6, we had talked about the priest, talk about the person, entering it regularly, talked about how often. Uh, the outer room, talking about the place and for what purpose to carry on their ministry um, is there in red. So then, verse 11 uh, when Christ came as the high priest of the, of the good things that are already here. What a beautiful title. 
um, high priest of the good things that are already here, that you and I are not waiting for anything more, that um, the high priest of the old covenant pointed ahead to the future reality and the future fulfillment in the Messiah. But Jesus, as our high priest now, um, he is the high priest of the things that are already here, um, the high priest of the forgiveness that we have and the presence of God among his people that we already have, that we aren't. And the, the point of comparison that he's driving at is that we aren't waiting for something more. <laughs> that the, the people living under the old covenant, they were waiting for something more, but we are not. Um, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not man-made, um, talking about, you know, by comparison, um, the, you know, we'll put that, there we go. Uh, talking about the place, where does he serve? Not in this, this man-made earthly tabernacle, but through the, the perfect place. Um, that is to say, not a part of this creation. Um, just talking about, you know, Jesus offered his, his blood, um, as a sacrifice that was received by God in heaven itself. And he continues to serve as our high priest there in heaven. Um, he did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, um, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood. So once for all, talking about how often, um, through what, for what purpose or for what use, and what was his duty there? Um, he, didn't, he didn't enter through the ministry and the interceding of the blood of another, but by his own blood, and that this is an eternal redemption. Um, talking about talking about how often that the once for all sacrifice here in verse twelve um, has carried out eternal redemption that it uh, applies for all people of all time um, one at one time for all people and the reason that it can be one time for all people is because it's not through the blood of inferior um, not through the blood of inferior sacrifices such as animals, but through the blood of the Son of God himself. And so, you know, the, the, the writer here is taking great pains to make sure to talk to the Hebrews in, in their own language, in a, in a language, in, in, in a setting that they understand, that the, communicates to them. Um, that he's, he's working from their Old Testament knowledge. He's working from their Old Testament history and worship life that they've had for, you know, 15, 1400 years. Um, and he's building off of that to say, friends, we have something greater in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Um, verse 13, the blood of goats and bulls, the ashes of a heifer, uh, sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean, sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. Um, the, the purpose, to make them ceremonially clean. And what he's saying there, you know, in verse 13, um, about being outwardly clean, is uh, that they are ceremonially clean by, by every human perception. That they had become ceremonially unclean for, for a period of time due to, you know, contact with the dead body, contact with mold or mildew, um, a certain time of the woman's month of her cycle uh, through having a child or any of those things. Um, and that's the, the outwardly outward things that a person could sense. Um, and the, the blood of those animals and the ashes of the heifer um, were, were what atoned for that external understanding, but there's something even greater. Verse 14, how much more then will the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God. Um, how much will he more cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we may also serve the living God. Talk about his purpose here. How does he enter um, this greater, greater tabernacle as, it, as our high priest? Um, he enters, you know, by comparison here, verses 13 to 14, he enters by his own blood. He offers himself as the one who is unblemished. Um, and he actually does cleanse the conscience, which is what we had uh, just talked about back in verse 9, that those gifts and sacrifices were not able to clear the conscience of the worshiper. The worshiper might have walked home that day um, with, 
hopefully with a settled conscience saying that, yes, God's promised Messiah will take away my sin. Um, they might walk, they might have walked home that day and said, yes, I know that I am ceremonially clean again, but I'm looking forward to the day when God will make me truly clean. And that's what Jesus does here down, down in verse 14. Notice the description of, of sin in verse 14. We've got about five minutes yet uh, here. Um, in verse 14, he calls sin, excuse me, he calls sin acts that lead to death. And what a stark contrast to what the natural mind thinks and to what the world around us would say. That um, the natural mind and the world around us, you know, one and the same really, would say that if you want to have freedom, then you have the freedom to do whatever you want, whenever you want, wherever you want, you know, keep on going if you want. Um, that that is truly freedom. But as Jesus talks about it in the Gospel of John, and as the writer says here, that anyone who sins is a slave to sin, and the wages of sin is death. And sin is, here in verse, uh, verse 14, that um, sin, is, sin is lawlessness, and sin is death. Um, and, and in all this, in all this, he cleanses our consciences, the, the hour that we're talking about here, um, cleansed by the blood of Christ, in in this in the consciences here um is the hour in verse 14 refers to back in verse 12 he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood that this this relationship this covenant relationship that god establishes with his people is not with the the nation of israel not with the political state of israel and those who are standing there at mount sinai and their descendants this re covenant relationship that god has made with people is far greater than that puny little foreshadowing covenant that this covenant is sealed by the blood of the son of god and it's and and this covenant applies for all people that no one is left out. No one is ex excluded. You know, verse 12, he entered the most holy place once for all. <laughs> that word there, once for all by his own blood. Um, that this, this covenant, which is really the fulfillment of what God has promised to Abraham and what God had talked about in Jeremiah 31, um, applies to all people. Verse 12, once for all and all people of all time, because in verse 12, he obtained eternal redemption. So that all people of all time who are reading this book um, and who know or who know about the person work of Jesus Christ have the promise of their conscience is being clean, uh, that your conscience is clean. Um, we'll, we'll leave most of the rest of this for next time, but uh, we, we should talk about the... Um, talk about conscience here just in just a minute for just a moment um cleanse our consciences that our i should change that back to green as well that it applies to all people of all time and um and our consciences from acts that lead to death we'll go with blue that um you know when god says all <laughs> that's a, that's a pretty big word and when we talk about consciences when we talk about guilt um, there's two ways that we talk about guilt. And most of the time when you and I talk about guilt, we talk about, um, you know, I'm feeling guilty. I'm carrying this guilt. I'm struggling with guilt. What you really mean is that you're struggling with the feeling of guilt. You're struggling with the perception of guilt. You're struggling with these guilt feelings um, as opposed to actual guilt. Um, the feelings are like the, the shadow and the actual guilt is like the, the tree, you know, that made the shadow. Um, that was a terrible analogy and I'm sure there's something better. Um, but we need to, we need to see, first of all, that Jesus has taken away our actual guilt, that the actual legal charge against us in God's court on the basis of his moral law for all people of all time was guilty, guilty as sin, quite literally. And Jesus is the one who through his blood has actually made people clean. You know, verses 12 through 14, the blood of Christ, he offered himself unblemished to cleanse our consciences. Um, and the our consciences, the, the all people of all time of verse 12. And, um, and so you can say without a shadow of a doubt that because the son of God shares my human flesh, my humanity, because this is the case, I know that my guilt has been taken away and my sin has been atoned for, that 
everything that kept me out of God's presence has been washed away in the blood of the Lamb of God. You can say that beyond a shadow of a doubt. And every person alive could say that. Um, if they forfeit it, and if they turn their back on their faith, or, on their faith, or they, they laugh at that idea, um, then they forfeit the blessing. But if the guilt is all on Christ on the cross, then none of it can be left on us. What a beautiful, beautiful thought. Um, so that's talking about the actual guilt. And it is possible, and one might even say probable, that at the same time, um, a Christian might experience feelings of guilt. Maybe, um, you know, other terms or synonyms that we'd use there would be like regret or uh, wishing that things had been different or wishing I had done things differently, carrying this, this burden, um, talk, you know, usually just talking about regret. And sometimes they say, well, pastor, I feel guilty about what happened. I feel guilty about what I did. Um, I still feel guilty about what happened, you know, 20 years ago. Um, you know, like who's the hardest, <laughs> the idea that, that when the announcement of forgiveness is made in a general way from the front of church, um, that, you know, pastor says to all people as he's looking back and forth or staring at the camera, that for the sake of Jesus Christ, your sin is forgiven. At the same time, it's like our sinful flesh is whispering, yeah, but that's not for me. Yes, but if you only knew, then, oh my, then they would know that I don't belong here and that I am an imposter, that I do not deserve to be forgiven. And if God knew, or if pastor knew what I did or when I did, or um, the, the zeal with which I pursued that sin, um, then he would not be saying such incredible things to me. And what a lie. Because verse 14, the blood of Christ offered, and this Jesus offered himself unblemished to God for the purpose of cleansing our consciences from acts that lead to death. That first of all, you know, at the end of verse 14 there in yellow, um, that sin presents itself and offers this, this promise that it never fulfills, this promise of freedom, that if you want to be free, then you just go ahead and engage in this sin and then you'll experience freedom. Um, false, <laughs> absolutely false. But then the other thing is that, that Jesus has taken away your actual guilt you know, verse 12, once for all, eternal redemption. And he also has, wants to continue to reassure you of this fact so that your conscience can be free from guilt, free from that perception of guilt, free, free from those feelings of guilt. And, and that word, the, this little phrase here in this clause, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death. Um, this clause, I can't underline that, shoot. Um, perhaps... Tips our, tips our hand just a little bit toward the reality of dealing with these feelings of guilt. And the fact that, you know, a person might carry guilt for a long time, what they, what they call guilt, what they mean is they have feelings of regret or feelings of guilt or feelings of shame. Um, and it is important that, that when we have that idea that, oh, but that forgiveness isn't for me, and I'm not good enough for God, that our fellow Christians, and hopefully our pastor, um, points us back to the object of reality of the blood of Christ, that he shed his own blood to take away all of your guilt, your actual guilt. And our sinful flesh wants to say, but I, I prefer to hold on to my feelings of guilt. I want to, I want to hold on to my guilty feelings because it's comforting to me. And then it feels like I can do something for myself or for my own salvation, or at least in some small way to assuage my own guilt, because that is my obligation. And that's how I pay God back. And that's not the gospel life. <laughs> the sinful flesh wants to take us and pull us away from Jesus, pull us away from the freedom of the cross and say, but Jesus didn't do it all. And God, God, I don't know how, how else to, to do it. He drops like a 10,000 ton Acme weight, you know, like Wiley E. Coyote dropping in a roadrunner or vice versa. Um, that God absolutely demolishes this idea that we still have to deal with our own feelings of guilt, that we still have to deal with our own feelings of regret because you know what, in God's court, it's done. And this Jesus through shedding his blood, entering the most holy place of heaven itself by his own blood, he once for all 
one time for all people, um, obtain re eternal redemption for all people of all time, so that you can be absolutely assured today that no matter what you feel about it, uh, your sin has been forgiven. And as a result, if God doesn't hold your sin against you, um, how arrogant and sinful flesh <laughs> to try to hold my own sin against me. Jesus has set me free and given me uh, that freedom through his blood. And, and that's kind of where Lutherans have always, there's a plane going overhead, it's kind of loud, where Lutherans have always celebrated this idea of private confession and absolution. If you come from a Catholic background, Roman Catholic background, you're probably familiar with private confession or private confession, confession and penance. Uh, where you go, and like you always see on TV, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. Um, and, or the mobster goes in, bless me, Father, for I am going to sin. Um, and, and the priest says, you know, go say five Hail Marys and 10 Our Fathers, and then you'll be forgiven, um, or as penance for your sin. That's not Lutheran, and that's not biblical private confession and absolution. The purpose of private confession and absolution is to, yeah, say those guilty things out loud. To say those sins out loud, um, so yeah, and, and the pastor hears it and buries it in his heart and probably forgets about it realistically because God has forgotten about it. And the point of Lutheran private confession absolution is the absolution that yes, God already knows our sin, that this Jesus has already carried our sin, that um, that God in His grace, in His gospel grace, begs us to allow and to leave all of our guilt to be to be on Christ, because He is the only one who can bear that burden, who has carried that burden, and so in Lutheran private confession and absolution, the the focus is on the absolution. I announce to you today, for the sake of Jesus Christ, that your sin, uh, fill in the blank of whatever it is that you just confessed to God Himself, as you confess it to me, um, has been forgiven. Why? verses 12 and 14, 12, 13 and 14, I guess, um, that once for all, Jesus obtained eternal redemption for all people to cleanse your conscience from sin, from acts that lead to death. For what purpose? So that we may serve the living God. Set free from sin for the purpose of serving the one true God. Does that make sense? Any questions? I think that that final discussion on uh, <laughs> sometimes in private confession absolution, I get going a little bit longer. So that was a good seven minutes. Um, any other questions as we wrap up? Maybe I'll stop the share and that'll open up the chat box. You know, Pastor, I just want to say, you know, I'm using this EHB version still. There is no all in verse 12. He entered once into the most holy place and obtained eternal redemption. No all. Seems like you think that's pretty important and it's not in this translation. <laughs> what one is that? The it's EHV, the... Evangelical Heritage Version. Yeah, huh. Like you kept saying that for all, for all. And I'm like, where is he reading yeah, it? Yeah, where is that? But then I'm looking at yours and looking at mine. My, it doesn't oh, have all. Nine, nine verse 12, there we go. Yeah, I remember that in the NIV 84. Uh, I don't know, is it in the 11 too? Oh my goodness. Yeah, um, I, I, won't, I won't bore you with the Greek, but it should be in there. Um, I'll write them a letter. Yeah, yeah, send it up to Adrian. Um, well, once, um, or once and for all. Um, and the, the most most common occurrences, well, there's three times where that particular word, um, once for all, are used in Hebrews. Um, we had it back in, in chapter 7, um, and we have it again in chapter 10. Um, it shows up in, in Romans chapter 6, and then it appears in 1 Corinthians 15. So it only shows up in the New Testament a total of uh, five times, and three of those five times are here in, um, here in Hebrews. But, but the, the word, you know, um, is actually a compound word um, where they, they have a prefix uh, attached to the word um, once, and, uh, and it kind of in, intensifies it. 
Um, and so in English, I think a, a good English translation would be like once and for all, you know, talking about the finality of it, that this isn't just, just a one-time event and it's like a run-of-the-mill one-time event. This is like a one-time event that is unequaled in any other way. Um, so I, I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, four or five years down the line, we have a revision of the EHV and uh, an adjustment <laughs> on, on some of these things as well. Because, um, and then my other question would be, you know, I'd have to look at the, the EHV translation. I think it, yeah, they've got it online. Um, because that word really should be once for all. Um, and it is a little bit interpretive to, to leave it out. Um, because, and there, there are a couple of other idiosyncrasies with the, the translation, but I don't know, last, last I'd heard about it, this was probably two years ago, that um, the Missouri Synod might be, might be getting on board with us and, and eventually transitioning a lot, of their, a lot of their work over to, out of the ESV yeah. um, and into the EHV. And so I wouldn't be surprised if that, if that comes about in the next two or three years. And, um, and then some of their scholars helped to, with the, the second revision, you know, kind of like with the NIV, the original NIV came out in 1978. Um, but then the, the one that had staying power was 1984. And, um, and there's, you know, like one of the, the bigger or more, more noticeable differences between 78 and 84 was in Psalm 23. Uh, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want the Lord is my shepherd. I shall lack nothing. <laughs> Anyway, yeah, that's a good point because, because um, and, and it's even in, in our gospel lesson for this coming, or for this past Sunday, um, was from Matthew 28, um, that God says, go and make disciples of all nations. And, and the way the EHV translated that was go and gather disciples from all nations. And doctrinally, I can, I can understand that, you know, when we're talking about God's doctrine of election, that as a, as a Christian uh, and as a pastor, all I'm doing is, is gathering those that that God had chosen ahead of time, you know, that the doctrine of election spurs on our mission work. Um, but the word there is not gather. The word there is make disciples. Um, and so there's, I don't know, that would probably be one of the things that we would have talked about in um, a district convention this year, but we didn't have one. So I got to be home instead of spending three and a half days in Saginaw. <laughs> Good question. Thank you. Any others? What's the last thing you said? Set free from sin for? Oh yeah, set um, set free from uh, for for a purpose. I'll bring that for the back purpose up. of for the purpose of serving God, and uh, and this happens um, very often. Um, here in verse verse fourteen is the example. Um, the second half of verse 14, because God often talks about, you know, what we are set free from and what we are set free for, um, kind of in a, in a negative and positive, um, not like bad and good negative and positive, but negative in what is taken away and positive what is added, that what is taken away is our sin and what is added is this ability and opportunity to serve the living God. Um, and so that's kind of the set free from, set free for. Good question. Anything else? Sounds like that would wrap us up. Um, tomorrow, yeah, tomorrow afternoon and evening, um, if you had known Tom Yost, um, his visitation is going to be at Mason Dardenne Funeral Home here in Maumee uh, from four o'clock until eight o'clock. And then um, funeral Saturday at 10 a.m. over at the funeral home um, as well. And uh, that's all the other news. So you said four to eight tomorrow? Yeah. Friday? Yep. Okay. Yeah, kind of a, kind of a long one. Did you put, I, I didn't know him, did you put uh, the funeral homes um, address in the email? Policy. Oh. Is there a policy as face mask or whatever else? Numbers might be important. I, yeah. I'll give them a call tomorrow morning. Yep. Um, Pastor, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Welcome to Bible study. We just uh, just finished Hebrews chapter 9. Well, we were watching it on Facebook because I couldn't find the Zoom. So, okay. But then I could get back on my phone. Mark and I had gone to a funeral of one of our friends, and they didn't require face masks. 
some people were wearing them and some people were not wearing them. So I think it's a preference on yourself. At least at this particular funeral home we were at, and we were at Reed Funeral Home. Okay. Cool. Are you not having the funeral service at church because of our limitations? Uh, no, actually, um, I tried to get into the hospital up at uh, up at St. Luke's um, Saturday, I think, or maybe maybe Friday. Um, and I talked to the receptionist. I talked to you know multiple people. I'm coming in wearing a face mask, and they said, "No, we're not allowing any visitors up there until Monday." And sure enough, um, he goes to heaven on Saturday night. I mean. <laughs> There's there's a short list of things that will really get me irritated, and and this is quickly at the top of that list. <laughs> That's too bad, but but yeah. still. So what about having him the funeral at yeah. church? Yeah. So I, then um then the, the the funeral home had called and uh, and said that this was what the plan was that they had coordinated with with Shelley or had talked with her family or whatever. Um, and, and I said, well, you know, we, we would be able to, to host a funeral at church, um, as well, cause we've got a fairly, you know, a place that has seating for nearly 200 people. And even if we had, um, you know, 60 people, you can still space out really, really well throughout the, um, throughout the sanctuary. And, uh, and, and so they, I talked to them about that and they said they'd talk with Shelly about it. And, uh, and then they just stuck with whatever they had for the funeral home. So she's mad at you because you didn't get up there? <laughs> no. no, we had a good chat about that. And, and I mean, it, it, is, it is one of those times where it's, you know, pastorally and personally, it's, it's frustrating. Um, but at the same time, you know, the promise of John chapter 10, that Jesus knows his sheep and holds on to them is, uh, is very comforting. Well, so was Shelly with him? Or was no. she not allowed up there either? She wasn't allowed there either. She got to talk to him on the phone. Um, and she may, I th yeah, I don't think she got up there before he passed. I think she got up there shortly after, but I, I don't recall. Oh, that's fine. So just a different time than we're used to. Yeah, I can say that that's again. Tom Yost you're talking about? Yeah, Tom yeah. Yost. Okay. Uh, married well, Shelly Bunce. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. Um, that's, I'm, that's two for her then, because Bob, yeah. Bob and Tom. So, yep. wow. And how is Shelly doing? <laughs> she's she's doing all right. She's still um, not in excellent health. Um, she's got MS, and yes, and, I know. You know. She has very tight dietary restrictions. Otherwise, it really throws her for a loop, and um, and she's tired. You know, like. Um, usually I can get her on the phone around noon or shortly after noon. That's usually a, a better time for her. Um, but I haven't always been, I mean, I have to, I'll probably stop by there tomorrow and, uh, and cause I've gotten her on the phone a couple of times this, but not, not in the last two days. And it's like, what's going on? Just care about you. Okay. So. Four to eight at. You're gonna send the address or something, right? Yeah, it, it was in the email. I sent it around uh, four o'clock today or three o'clock. Uh, okay, Mason, then, then I'll see it. It's at Conant Street, right down from the um, theater. Yeah, I I think I know where it is. I just want to make sure that was it. I don't know enough about Mommy to know if there's other ones, but okay, if it's on Conan, I know where it is. Cool. All right, I'm leaving. Say bye. Have a great bye. evening. Bye, bye Jane. Hi, Jean. Cool. That wraps us up. Bye, Pastor. Thank you.